Disneyland has always had a big river and a Mississippi sternwheeler. It seemed appropriate to create a new attraction at the bend of the river. And so Disneyland's New Orleans Square came into being. New Orleans was the birthplace of marching jazz bands. Here in Disneyland's New Orleans Square, this tradition is an everyday occurrence. Look, I'm sorry. I'd really like to help you, but I just do not kiss frogs. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, join us down at the riverside. It's time for W Radio. Your information station. Hello, my friend, and welcome to the WW Radio Show. Your passport to the Disney parks. I am your host, Lou Mangiello, and this is show 779. And together, since 2004, when I wrote my very first Walt Disney World trivia book, I've wanted to help you not only have the best possible vacation experience when you go to the parks, but I also want to bring you a little bit of Disney magic wherever you are here on the podcast, my weekly live video every Wednesday night, the blog, live events, weekly newsletter, and more. Please join the community and find everything at www.radio.com. So this week's episode is very special as it was recorded at the home of Walt Disney Imagineering in Glendale, California. I had a very, very special opportunity and privilege to be invited to Imagineering and the Walt Disney Studios for a secret peek, literally, behind the curtains at Imagineering, including projects and technologies they are developing for the future of the Disney parks. I'm gonna share not just details from my visit, but my exclusive interview with the lead Imagineers on Tiana's Bayou Adventure for a look at some of the details, secrets, and stories behind the attraction. Then stay tuned for our Disney trivia question of the week where you can enter for a chance to win a Disney prize package and more updates at the end of the show. Please connect and chat with me on social. I am at Lou Mangiello on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn, and subscribe to the WW Radio channel on YouTube and like the WW Radio page on Facebook at facebook.com slash WW Radio. And if you like what you hear, and I hope that you do, please share the show and tell a friend. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of the WW Radio Show. You've come to the right place. This is our Imagineering department. It is here where we dream up all the future things for Disneyland. It is also here that we dreamed up the things for the World's Fair. Thanks to you, seriously, and because I would not be here literally and figuratively if it weren't for you. So thanks to you, this past week I had the incredible opportunity and honest privilege to be invited by Walt Disney Imagineering to their home in Glendale, California for a peek inside the future of Imagineering. And it was an absolutely remarkable opportunity to be able to be among a very, very small select few to be invited on this trip, which also provided a stop to the Walt Disney Studios. And my visit to Imagineering was nothing short of, of mind blowing um, as I was not only able to see some of the incredible technology and storytelling that's being worked on for the parks, but getting to speak to a number of the magicians, because that's what they are behind the scenes who are bringing these stories to life. And as you may or may not know, Walt Disney Imagineering at 1401 Flower Street in Glendale, California is the magic factory that houses the theme park design team that works on the parks, Disney Cruise Line, and the resorts globally. And when we talk about Imagineering, these are not just designers and storytellers, because there's more than 140 different disciplines from model making to writing to computer engineering and financial planning and everything in between. And what I want to share on this week's show is just a small part of my experience there, which was an exclusive interview with two of the Imagineers, the storytellers, the magic makers behind Tiana's Bayou Adventure. But before I get into the actual interview, I want to sort of set the stage and share more about my visit and experience at Imagineering with you, which I think will also help give 
additional context to the interview as well. And I thought a lot about how to best share this with you. So I thought that instead of just talking to you about it, I want to talk with you about it. So what I'm going to do today is give you a brief-ish overview of the trip here on the show, but I also want to make this interactive, and I want to take your questions about the experience. So on this week's WW Radio Live show on YouTube and Facebook this Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern, I'm going to share more details about what I saw, take your questions, and we can then discuss what's coming to the parks um, in terms of attractions and technology and experiences and maybe even speculate a little bit about what some of what I saw and heard means and what we might hear announced at this summer's D23, the ultimate Disney fan event in Anaheim this August. So I want to briefly-ish take you through my experience in, in relative order. I wasn't able to photograph, obviously, most of what I saw, but I do want to share just sort of a chronological idea of what my very quick trip in and out of Glendale looked like. So I flew in to Glendale on Monday and Tuesday morning, they actually brought me over to WDI early before the group uh, experience started to interview Sharita Carter and Ted Robledo, who were sort of the lead project managers on Tiana's Bayou Adventure. But unbeknownst to me, they also had some surprises in store to help give context to the interview I was about to do. So let me just say first that going to 1401 Flower is as amazing and thrilling as it sounds. I was I was trying to be cool, but I was smiling ear to ear. And I've, I've been very fortunate to visit before, but as part of our WW Radio Adventures by Disney a number of years ago, more on that later, but this time was very different because I was brought in, brought into the back offices while I waited to do the interview and sort of have this, you know, surprise um, shared with me. And look, I, I am always and will always be a fan first. And it, it was amazing just to see this who's who of Imagineering royalty walking these literal hollowed halls, just going to work, right? Going to work every day. And I had a chance to see and chat with some folks that I knew and haven't seen for a long time and had the very fortuitous uh, opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Josh tomorrow before he walked into a meeting. Uh, more on Josh later, but my love and respect and appreciation for him as a leader, for him as a creative, and just him as a really good human being continues to grow with every interaction that I get to have with them. But they then brought me over. Uh, they drove me over to one of the many nondescript buildings on the very large WDI campus and literally pulled back the curtain for me because there it was like where Willy Wonka's factory meets a peek into the future because I was given a personal tour, literally, like they pulled black curtains back of the area where the final touches were being put on the audio animatronic figures for Tiana's Bayou Adventure in Disneyland, as the Walt Disney World figures are already installed. And it's one thing to see these figures as you float or ride by on an attraction, or to see a behind-the-scenes video on Disney Plus or YouTube, but it's something else completely when you can get inches away from these characters in different states of completion as they are being tested and adjusted from nearly finished characters to remarkable, incredibly inventive skeletons that reveal the inner workings that bring these characters to life, which is what they feel like. Because as you get close, the, the realistic Faces that feel like these 2D animations were just literally pulled off the screen and brought into the third dimension. The texture on the hair, the, the bounce, that little sort of subtle bounce that Lewis the alligator has in his excited steps. And even the way the figures move so fluidly, and it can almost sort of get a sense of the muscles that are underneath these bespoke handmade costumes and so much more that we're all going to see when the attractions open. I want to take a pause for a second because this experience really was full circle for me because I haven't discussed 
nor shared anything about this before this. But in May of last year, I was actually invited by Disney and Imagineering for a very, very special opportunity to join the Imagineers on a journey into the early creative process behind an attraction like Tiana's Bayou Adventure. So in May 2023, um, I was brought out to New Orleans for a few days of everything from imagining presentations to a, a, a boat tour of the Bayou, the Yaya Art Center. We had dinner at Dookie Chase's restaurant with some very special guests, museum visits, the Jazz Museum, which was amazing. We had lunch at the legendary Preservation Hall, met some of the artists and artisans and musicians who work on Tiana's Bayou Adventure. We went over to Mardi Gras World and a number of other surprises and experiences and guests along the way that really gave a sense of what an Imagineering research trip feels like, right? Being immersed in the culture and the cuisine and the history and the people and the music. And there is a feel to New Orleans, and I love New Orleans, the city, just even outside this, that was clearly part of the inspiration for Tiana's bioadventure, because this attraction, as we're going to see, goes far beyond the four corners of the Princess and the Frog story, but really sort of embodies the culture and the people and the history and the spirit of New Orleans itself. And so now that this is sort of coming around full circle, I will finally be able to share some photos and videos from that trip, and I'll share it on social this week and on the WW Radio site, and we can talk about it more on the live show on Wednesday. But let me get back to this trip and the time at Imagineering. So after my interview, uh, I went back to my hotel, dropped off some of my gears, and then was brought on a shuttle over with just a very few. Again, I, I was incredibly honored and privileged to have been part of a very select few, like a literally, you know, you can count them all on one hand that was brought over on this experience. And we went back, checked in at Imagineering and started what was a whirlwind trip around the Imagineering and Walt Disney Studios campus, starting off with a visit, again, talking about sort of hollowed ground and special places. You, I know you know what I mean. And getting to go to Walt Disney's office in Suite 3A, at the Walt Disney Studios, because nestled literally in the heart of the studio lot amidst the corridors that have literally birthed the Disney classics is an absolute treasure trove of Disney history, which is Walt Disney's impeccably restored office. And this alone could be a separate conversation for a separate podcast, but Walt Disney occupied Studio 3H from 1940 until his death in 1966, and it really was the creative center of what's now the Walt Disney Company. And back in 2015, the Walt Disney Archives, started by Dave Smith and is now continued by Becky Klein and her team, they, when I say painstakingly restored this historic space to its grandeur, like the day it was when Walt Disney left the office, it is not an exaggeration. The books are exactly, in, not only in the same place, but the same order, leaning the same way. Every paperclip, literally every paperclip is accounted for. Dave Smith, again, meticulously went in, photographed everything, and it was absolutely and beautifully restored to the way it was when, walked, when Walt walked out. And to say it is an emotional experience, and again, I've been here before, I've been privileged to be here before as part of our WWE group Adventures by Disney, you can't help but sort of feel your heart palpitate a little bit. And yes, I got like a little bit choked up. I'm a very sentimental person. I get it. But I, I sort of felt tears welling in my eyes, even as we sort of approached, you know, the, the secretary's outer office and you go into Walt's formal office where you can, I, I just sort of stood there and imagined, you know, the, these echoes of, of deals and dreams sort of coming together within those walls. And then knowing that, Every item from the pencils on his desk to the Norman Rockwell sketches to the piano that Richard Sherman played for him on Fridays tells such an important, rich and, and for I know for a lot of us, meaningful stories. And 
you see these books and you see these sketches and you see these miniatures and imagine how they were one little spark of, of inspiration for the attractions that we still get to enjoy today. You then go into a second office, which was sort of Walt's working office. And there you really sort of got this sense of the, the pulse of creativity. And, and you look at the desk and I imagine these conversations and possibly arguments that took place over and around this lower than normal height desk as artists and Imagineers poured over what was then secret plans. And, you know, you start thinking about the mysteries and the marvels of a world that's being created out of the imagination, literally in that room. And attached to that room is Walt's little kitchen where, you you know, they, they opened up the cabinets and there was the cans of V8 vegetable juice and Hormel chili and Spam and corn and Jello, And I remember just spending time just looking out the window at the studio's water tower, imagining that's where Walt stood. And that was the window that he looked out on. And even now, like telling the story, I find myself getting emotional thinking about that man and that place. From there, you go into Walt's private gallery, which has a ton of, of wonderful, very personal artifacts from his life, which I think is such an important reminder that this global icon, right, whose name we see, you know, emblazoned on movie titles and marquees and, and theme parks was a man uh, to a certain degree, sometimes a very simple man, but who was driven by this relentless passionate pursuit of excellence and a deep, deep love of storytelling. Um, and and I just, to be clear, I share this with you, not because I, I always feel weird. I don't want this to ever feel like, oh, look what I did. Look where I am. I share this with you because I want you to do this as well. Because while Walt's office is not open to the public, you can visit Walt's office on your stop on an Adventures by Disney Hollywood, which is now called the Hollywood and Disneyland tour, uh, which you've actually done twice before as a WW Radio group, which got me thinking, maybe it's time to do it again. Quick aside, maybe thinking out loud, would you like to join me on another WW Radio Adventures by Disney to the Walt Disney Studios and the archives and Imagineering, the Jim Henson Studios and Walt's apartment in Disneyland? If so, let me know in the comments in the clubhouse. We'll circle back to this later on. But I want to get back to the day at Imagineering because we did head back over to Walt Disney Imagineering and really start to get this very close, detailed and behind the scenes look at the near and future plans and technologies at Walt Disney Imagineering. So we went back to Imagineering at 1401 Flower and started a guided tour of a number of the buildings and offices and facilities in there, uh, including the, the model shop and got to see a lot of very close to the miniatures from Tokyo Disney Sea to Disney's Animal Kingdom to Star Wars Galaxy's Edge to a number of the different parks. And these are the models that actually are used to be scanned in and are the, the three-dimensional blueprints for the attractions that we get to experience. We walked over to the Blaine Gibson sculpting shop, which was incredible and had hundreds of maquettes and statues and molds for the audio animatronic heads. And we're given a presentation by an Imagineer whose job it is to do those sculpts and helped to craft uh, figures like Walt the Dreamer and, and the process of their creation which was helpful because when we did go back or we went to where the uh, Tiana's Bio Adventure figures were being worked on and got that very close up and personal look at what and who is coming to Tiana's Bio Adventure, it really gives you a sense of not just how audio animatronics technology has involved, evolved, but the painstaking work, again, from a number of different disciplines to bring these figures to life. And again, we were able to see them in various states of uh, assembly and operation and testing and, and hear some of the audio that was coming through and, and really got to pay closer attention to the costumes and the hair. And like, like I said, the muscles under the arms and how each of the costumes is 
bespoke to each of the figures. And it was on this second visit that my sort of light bulb went off and I was chatting with some of the folks from Imagineering because I realized by watching these characters and hearing some of the dialogue that unlike a number of attractions like Peter Pan's Flight, where we go through and we are watching these scenes and vignettes unfold in front of the in front of us as sort of passive observers, Tiana's Bio Adventure is going to be different because the characters are aware of us. They they see us going through this attraction. They interact and they talk to us. And I think that's such an interesting choice and I think progression from something like Splash Mountain. And I think adds another level of fun and realism and personalization of the attraction. And it's also why the technology laid over the storytelling is important because these characters are looking at us in the eye. They are speaking directly to us. So it becomes a much more almost personal relationship with each guest as they float through each of the scenes. And I talk more with Sharita and Ted not just about this part of the experience, but how and why these details are important in the interview. So uh, moving on from there, we also went to a place that I had never seen before and is normally off limits to groups, Adventures by Disney or otherwise, which is the Research and Development Building, which was mind-blowing. Um, this was an opportunity to see not just technology that is being rolled out in the parks now, but some of what is coming in the future. So we got to meet and get very close to some of the Star Wars BDX droids that are now back in Disneyland in Batu for a season of the Force and see and hear from and talk to some of the Imagineers in terms of how they were developed, uh, the technology that is used to bring life to these adorable little robots. We also got to see um, the next generation of audio animatronics figures. You may have seen them on videos like Duke Weaselton and the Judy Hopps figures. And to see them operate in person is, it was the first of many, like how did they do that moments? Because from there, we went over to another section of the building where the hollow tile floor, and I'm sure you've seen the video of Imagineer Lanny Smoot, who I interviewed back on show 767 about the hollow tile floor, but to see this technology in action, to see even more in terms of how it is being used and the future of virtual reality and gaming and theme park applications. And I can only imagine just using or even licensing this technology for other applications that we probably haven't even conceived as yet. To say that this is a game-changing technology, not just for the Disney parks, I think as time is going to illustrate um, is, is not an overstatement of just what this is going to be able to do. But then... Very much unexpected. Uh, we were asked to take a little step back. Um, fortunately, I was right up in front because I'm short and I can't see over people. So I was right up in front. Uh, they asked us to take take a step back and another Imagineer walks in and he's got it. He's he's holding it. He's holding the lightsaber. The one that you probably saw Josh tomorrow demonstrate at Destination D. You may have seen Ray operate on the Halcyon at the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser. I was standing two feet away and I watched this lightsaber ignite and <laughs> my mouth, you know, was was agape. And then he says, would anybody like to try it? And the woman next to me says, yes, I'm already sort of planning my move. I'm like, oh, let me please, let me hold your notebook and pen for you. One, because I was trying to be a gentleman. And two, I knew exactly what would hopefully happen next, which it did because when she was done, I said, oh, here, let me hand you your notebook and pen back. Let me take that that lightsaber out of your hand. And I am not too proud or whatever to admit this, but I stood up there and I felt myself getting a lump in my throat and just said, if my dad and my brother and my son could see me now and they said, turn it on. And I hit that button and I watched this blade ignite and I was inches away from it. I have no idea how it works. I don't care how it works because I held a lightsaber 
in my hand and I, I'm doing it right now. I was grinning ear to ear because I thought about me and my dad in 1977 at Middlesex Mall watching Star Wars in the fourth row just with our mouths agape and to have that opportunity and to have that experience and, and to see and do something like that just... It, it made my seven-year-old heart very, very happy. And I can imagine my dad looking down, hopefully smiling as well. Sorry, I get nerdy and emotional and sentimental. Uh, I can't help it. Anyway, from there, uh, we saw a number of other things um, as, as we walked the halls. And then we're given a very, very special surprise and appearance and presentation at what's coming. You may have heard the term, the turbocharging of the Disney parks. From a number of folks at Imagineering, including the, the chief creative officer, Bruce Vaughn, uh, another Imagineering lead who presented on some of the new concept art for upcoming park expansions uh, beyond Big Thunder. While details remain undisclosed, we did see some permit filings, which are going to be um, filed and, and released relatively soon. And the beginning of the development for not just beyond Big Thunder Mountain, but Disney's Animal Kingdom and the reimagining of Dino Land, including the Tropical Americas, Indiana Jones, Encanto, and what appears to be a Coco Carousel. Um, there was also some peaks at Disneyland Forever. And then the big surprise was uh, being treated to a presentation and conversation with CEO Bob Iger and head of Parks and Resorts, Josh Tomorrow. Just as a quick aside, you know, I've been fortunate to meet and, and chat with both of them um, over the years, but there is something Bob Iger has a presence when he walks into a room that is so commanding, not in an intimidating way, but so he commands the room with the energy that he brings and is so incredibly well-spoken. I found myself looking over my shoulder at one point to see if he was reading off a teleprompter, which he was not, as they talked exclusively about the parks and resorts and the investment strategies for the park expansion, right? We're hearing these this term being used over and over again, the turbocharging growth in the experience business and the commitment of, you know, the $60 billion investment plan. And, you know, I love how they sort of brought home what we had seen throughout the day and this synergy between technology and artistry and storytelling in the parks and, and the films as well. Um, and a little bit more hints about upcoming expansions and franchises that are coming to the screens, but specifically to the theme parks. And I, I really appreciated how this was not just sort of looking forward, but this acknowledgement and reverence and respect of the history and the significance of Walt Disney Imagineering and the blend of not just technical engineering disciplines, but imagination as well. And, you know, the, the sort of reflective comments from Bob and Josh on the importance of continuing innovation and the strategic innovation and integration of new and different franchises into the parks. And it was just a, a very special way to punctuate a very, very special day. And again, this is a, a relatively very high level overview because there was so much more that we saw and experienced. And, you know, one of the things that I think was important as a, as a takeaway too. And it's part of the reason why I'm sharing this with you is the idea of Imagineering peeling back the literal and figurative curtain, not just for us, but for all guests as well. Because we did hear right before it was revealed about how you can experience some of this at home. They want to let you peek as well and sort of allow you to sort of get behind those velvet ropes, not necessarily just by doing uh, you know, an Adventures by Disney type of tour, but the new YouTube series that pulls the curtain back called We Call It Imagineering, right? We've already seen some of this a little bit on the Imagineering story and some of the other shows on Disney Plus, but this new YouTube series really is a much more, I think, up close and personal and intimate look behind the scenes. And I love that extension of 
trust that they have and are giving to us as guests to let us understand how this all comes together because it doesn't spoil the magic. I think it enhances it um, that much more. And I think that's what the takeaway was for me for this experience because this was not this was not an opportunity to, to spoil anything, right? But really get a sense of the creative process and work, the extensive work that goes into creating an attraction, right? Specifically something like Tiana's Bio Adventure. This is something that is years in the making and the research doesn't just happen at a desk or at a computer, but going to these places and the importance of understanding, representing the culture and the people and the place and the history. And I think for me, it definitely helps. And for us, it helps to frame my conversation with Sharita and Ted, both of whom were on that New Orleans trip with me last year. So it really is closing the circle almost, right? We'll fully close the circle when we all get to experience the attraction soon. But I think as I sort of reflect on this Imagineering showcase, it really sort of gave a glimpse into the future of the Disney parks. Um, we see the investments and growth and innovation that they're making. They're celebrating the legacy of creativity and the role in storytelling through the use, right? Not, not because of, but through the use of cutting edge and true next generation technology that we have never seen anywhere or before. And I think too, there's also a sense of continued and maybe for some people renewed optimism for this next generation of park additions, right? And, and underlying the importance of innovation while still honoring the legacy of the, the Disney parks. Um, I think this helped also sort of set up the anticipation for what we are going to see and hear and experience at D23, the ultimate Disney fan event this summer in Anaheim. So once again, I wanted to share this story with you to help sort of frame my conversation, um, to help share with you this opportunity to see this groundbreaking technology and some of the storytelling and, and really, more importantly, the people that make the dream a reality, right? These 140 plus disciplines at Imagineering, not just artists, but architects and scientists and producers and project managers and programmers and model makers and mathematicians and everything in between. So with all that in mind, I did say that I started my day with an opportunity for an exclusive interview uh, to get to sit down in those hallowed halls of Imagineering with Walt Disney Imagineers, Sharita Carter and Ted Robledo. So I hope you enjoy my conversation. All I wish is that I had more time to chat with them. And I would love to hear your thoughts, either about the experience that I had at Imagineering, uh, my conversation with Sharita and Ted, Tiana's bio adventure, Imagineering, or anything in between. I will post this question over in the clubhouse. I invite you to come be part of the community and conversation over at www.radio.com slash clubhouse. But for now, please enjoy my conversation with Imagineers Sharita Carter and Ted Robledo. Just as we had to learn to make our animated cartoons talk, we had to find a way to make these characters talk too. Now to accomplish this, we created a new type of animation. So new that we had to invent a new name for it. Ah, ah, ooh, ah, 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 audio animatronics? Right, audio animatronics. Ooh. Audio for sound. See, an electronically animated by sound. That's, That's what a... he's trying to say. Ah, Thank ah, you, that's what I was trying to say. So as we very anxiously await the opening of Tiana's Bayou Adventure in Walt Disney World and Disneyland, dare I say we're almost there. I promise that will be the last of the bad puns that I do. Actually, that's not true because I wanted to dig a little deeper um, with Sharita Carter, the executive creator producer, and Ted Robledo, the executive director uh, from Walt Disney Imagining, where we are actually recording today. It is an absolute honor and privilege to be in these hallowed halls and to be sitting with you this morning. So first, thank you for your time and the opportunity. Our pleasure. Our absolute pleasure, Lou. And I'm just so excited that you're so excited about what we're bringing to the gas. Yeah. I mean, I think that's at this point at this stage of a project, this is one of my favorite parts is where we get to share 
and see the excitement on people's faces because that's this is all we've wanted to do from the very beginning, you know. And so this is now we're getting into the fun. This is obviously a fun for us as well. So we, we we we're talking a little bit about the fans. Let's sort of start there because if you want to make Disney fans react, tell them that you're changing something. <laughs> God forbid taking something away. Um, and and clearly the internet potentially loses its mind, but also gets excited. Can you talk a little bit about how you? balance that sense of nostalgia and sentiment that we all have, right? These parks mean, and these characters mean so very much to us with bringing these new stories to life. Yes. Well, I've often said that if Walt Disney was with us right now, he would be doing the very same thing. And the reason for that is he was always very curious. And we as the Disney company, we are so prolific in our storytelling. We have so many opportunities and new stories that we tell. And so this opportunity to continue to just refresh our parks, give our guests something new. Um, as you know, I've worked a lot on the technical and kind of technique of how we actually manifest our attractions. And we're forever pushing the envelope. And so this opportunity to tell new stories and to give our guests new ways of experiencing our attractions, I think, is really a part of the DNA of Imagineering. And it started with Walt. Now, I certainly understand the nostalgic aspect of it. You know, I grew up going to Disneyland and I had my favorite attractions and I have wonderful family memories. But I can also say this. Every time we change something out, we win our audiences over because that same DNA of just fun, um, good storytelling and opportunity to be immersed in a story um, that you love. None of that has ever changed. And so it's just really kind of amusing to me because, as you said, it's very consistent. Every time we change something, there's this, you know, panic on the Internet. But I can tell you in recent history that I've been aware of every single time we win the guests over. And so we're just always really excited about bringing our guests fresh new experiences. Yeah, and to kind of further what you were saying, Shreda, for me, I like to think of it as we're not just building for an audience for guests today. We're building for the next generation and the generation after that. I grew up with Disneyland in the, in the 1970s, and some of what I thought were my favorite things, rides and attractions at Disneyland, at Tomorrowland, they're no longer here, right? But some of them have been, re some of them have been replaced or uh, things have been added that when I look back at like when my son was born, you know, kid maybe 20 years ago, the version of Disneyland that he came to and saw was very different than the version of Disneyland that was near and dear to my heart. But to him, that's what Disneyland had always been at that moment in time. And then you have a next generation. And when they show up there for the first time in the park, whether it's Magic Kingdom, whether it's Disneyland, whether it's Tokyo Disneyland, whether it's Paris Disneyland, Hong Kong, that moment in time for that guest, that is to them, that is the Disney, right? It, 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 they don't necessarily have the luxury, if you will, of the history of it and the legacy to kind of compare and contrast. So what we need to be, we need to be sure we do is whatever we do bring to the new stories or whatever we do bring that's new to the parks, that it does become that, that, that touch point that, that the new guest and guests from the past can, re that'll resonate with them. Because even with Tiana's Bayou Adventure, we know in the D, what's in the DNA of that ride that made it fun for guests. We definitely didn't take away any of that. In fact, we just added to it. So, yeah, I was going to say, if I could just build upon that specifically for Tiana's Bayou Adventure, we looked at the dynamics of the ride potential and the fact that it has always been that coming of age attraction for guests because of that big drop, right? We knew that that's something that we wanted to keep. And then also the aspect of our guests love to experience musicals, right? And you just, you, there's just so much emotional connection. And so we wanted to make sure that we were really capitalizing on that and just really taking it to the next level. I mean, anytime you're doing an attraction that is themed after New Orleans and you think about music, right? That it's, it's a home run. So we were really excited about that. And as Ted said, looking at just the elements of what makes that attraction very special and then taking it to the next level was our approach. And so continuing this idea of taking things to the next level and, and extending the story, you chose not to simply retell what we saw in the film, The Princess and the Frog, but instead extend Tiana's story really with a focus on not just the, the vibrant culture of Mardi Gras, but one of the things that I love about the character and the story, but is her entrepreneurial spirit. 
Uh, yes, it's been over a decade since our guests had the um, opportunity to interact with Tiana. And so we wanted to take this opportunity to give them more Tiana and just to be able to go a little deeper, if you will, uh, into her personality and those things that our guests love about her so that they could see her in her next chapter. And we were really excited about doing that because, like I said, we have this opportunity to introduce her to a whole new generation. And the fact that we're putting her in a dimension space allows us to tell the story um, in a way beyond what our guests saw at, in the animated film. And so we've really taken advantage of that opportunity to just give our guests a little bit more time with Tiana and you get to see what motivates her and um, the things that she loves and the things that makes her so special. Yeah. And I think that what we've done is kind of create a, a, a more multidimensional Disney princess with, with Tiana. We didn't invent anything, you know. In looking back at that film, she came already armed with all of these interesting personality traits. The fact that her father, uh, you know, she cultivated helped cultivate her love of cooking, but was also, you know, a, a, an American veteran. Her mother was a dressmaker. Maybe that's where she got her entrepreneurial spirit. So she's a, she's just a much more real person. Um, and I, you know, it's funny. If I look at my resume of, of, of Disney attractions that I've opened. It's just like I, I'm pretty Disney. Princess heavy. When I look back at it, I got one one super one Marvel superhero. And the rest are Disney princesses, and it's been great. But something that kind of struck me with this particular Disney princess is that she's more real and more like us. And so this this idea of her and her entrepreneurial spirit, and and just really what is just the setup for the adventure that we go on that is not part of the setup of this business place. It's just our opportunity, as, as Shuri was saying, just to expand upon that and just show how multidimensional she is and how proud is she, how proud she is and how connected she is to her community, to New Orleans, her family. And so in, in all the research trips that we did going to New Orleans and meeting all these incredible people, the Chase family, all these folks, how could you not make that part of the story? Because clearly, even in the opening sequence of that film, that is who she is. And that city is as much of a character in that film and as much of a part of who Tiana is uh, as, as Tiana herself. So we, you know, we had to have a lot of that, what makes New Orleans special in this attraction as well. Yeah, I was going to say that this is, this is not just a story of Tiana, but a story of New Orleans itself. And last year I had the remarkable opportunity to go on this secret little <laughs> trip to New Orleans with you and it was amazing and, and enlightening for me because it gave me what I imagine is a very small taste of the process that you go through right in terms of look we know that everything speaks the details matter especially when you're talking about a real place um, and you see some of the, the, the not just the, the locations but the ways that you gain in, inspiration so how do you sort of ensure that this attraction authentically represents the diverse culture and the music and the stories of New Orleans, not just what we see in, in the quarter, but in the bayou and the ecosystem as well. Well, as you mentioned, um, the fact that the team spent quite a bit of time there on the ground, we had the opportunity to meet the people of New Orleans. And I can't say enough about how special the people of New Orleans are. And everything about that city is unique. It is a unique uh, United States city. It has an incredible heritage. And when you think about the music and then you think about the food and the people, there's just so much that the city offers. And so we really, really um, spent time talking to people, talking to subject matter experts, spending time, you know, literally walking the streets of New Orleans, being a part of Mardi Gras and just really experiencing firsthand that spirit um, and that cadence of that amazing celebration were all things that really helped us as a creative team, as a designing team, bring authenticity uh, to this attraction, um, which I, you know, I, I can't say enough about how important uh, that was to us. But then in addition to that, we took it to the next level because we had the unique opportunity to actually collaborate with a number of artisans from New Orleans. So now we have things that our guests will experience firsthand that were actually crafted and built from, you know, New, New Orleans residents. And I really think that that will really speak to our guests in terms of just the real true spirit of the city of New Orleans and the surrounding area. Yeah, well, I mean, again, the way the connection that New Orleans has to its its history 
and you were there. It's just clearly some a lot of those folks are proud of their city, proud of that history and the complexity of that that history. Um, but a lot of these artisans that we've brought on board, we you know we want to be as authentic as possible, not because it's a mandate. We don't want to be didactic here. We don't want everyone everything that we're doing that is authentically New Orleans. We want to do in service to the story and have it help and contribute to that story. And one of these other ways, too, that we're being, again, authentic is bringing in, you know, these musical voices from New Orleans, like Terrence Blanchard and, of course, P.J. Morton, who's written this amazing new original theme song for the attraction. They're both born and raised in, in, in New Orleans. P.J. still lives there, but Terrence lives all across the United States. But we knew we had to go to folks who knew the city, who knew the vibe of the city from a musical standpoint to really, again, Sort of share with our guests something that's that's real, right? It's it 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 that New Orleans vibe, that New Orleans sound is is it's only it's it's, it's exclusively I would say or uniquely New Orleans. So we had to have you know musicians and talent from New Orleans, you know, come on this journey with us to help deliver that. Yeah, there's there's a um, unless you've been there, you can't. It's very hard to articulate. There's a special energy in that city that. You know, I've been fortunate to travel a lot of places. I don't feel anywhere else. And the music is so important, not just to the city, but even to the original film itself. So how do you sort of ensure that the music resonates with sort of the heart and the soul of New Orleans while still allowing it to be sort of connected to the original film as well? Well, I'll say to that that our partners over at Walt Disney Studios um, did a wonderful job um, going in and taking a similar approach initially as we as Imagineers have in terms of wanting to get just the cadence, the heartbeat, and the sound of the city. And so one of the things that was important to us as we were telling this next chapter was we wanted to make sure that we were giving our guests something that was familiar, something that connected them initially to the film. And that's why we chose to take a number of the songs and kind of reimagine them, if you will, in a way that our guests would have that initial connection. And then we um, had the privilege of then taking them further along in the journey. As Ted mentioned, we have an original song that has been written for the finale that we just know our guests are going to absolutely love. So it's just really in line with this ability to start on that wonderful foundation of the film and they continue to build upon it to give our guests something really fresh and new that will bring a lot of joy yeah and with that music that amazing music from from the uh, from the film we've also found an opportunity here because this is a next chapter story to maybe exercise some of the knowledge that we learned in, in some of the places that you you visited uh and, and learning about the history of New Orleans and the 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 origins of the people who came from all over the globe, from Africa, from from Europe, you know, colonists, you know, from North America all the way back down to to Louisiana, and that 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 culmination of all those different voices created this unique sound, and they brought with them their musical traditions. So, I don't want to say too much, but we are being authentic to that film, and as you said, Sri, using things and musical songs and themes that are familiar to our guests, so putting a little bit of a twist on it based on the knowledge that we learned about all of the different musical origins that came to New Orleans. So we want to find that balance. We want to find that balance of, like you said, you know, giving somebody, giving our guests, the fans, something familiar. But hey, if we have this opportunity to do something new and see it through a different lens, why not? And that's a perfect segue because also you have such great opportunity to introduce new characters as well. We're just starting to see hints of some of the new characters. Talk about the decision of the inspiration behind them and how these new characters give you the opportunity to enhance the story and enhance the narrative itself. Okay, um, we talk about Laura West as being the mama of the critters, but if there's a pop of the critters, it's Ted. So I'm going to let him take this one initially. <laughs> well, okay, so, you know, again, I, I, I'm of the... Uh, older set of, of Imagineers. And I grew up, you know, um, with the privilege of experiencing, experiencing a lot of the, the original stories and the original characters in all these theme parks, uh, starting with Disneyland. But And I was there as a middle school kid at the opening of Epcot. And there's, there's a, so many original stories that are in original characters. You know, so we're talking everything from Country Bear Jam, growing up to, to, to Figment. And I just thought, wouldn't it be wonderful to, to since this is the next chapter story, to to bring new characters, new friends to our guests, right? That 
you know, to, so that in a way, selfishly, I could kind of capture that feeling that I had where it's just like, oh, who is this figment dragon? I've, I've never seen this guy before, you know, and these bears who play the piano or whatever, you know, um, I wanted to, you know, to create that opportunity for, 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 uh, for Tiana's Bayou Adventure again. So we got the perfect Imagineer to help us with that Laura West, as you imagine. And she's the mama of 17 brand new characters that I say, one of the things, my, one of my favorite things about them is, is that is she, I, I think she's giving you every type of, of character or personality type out there. Old, young, big, small, you name it. It's their family units. And I think that's great because for our guests who have, you know, come from all different walks of life and backgrounds, you know, families. We want to give them a lens through each one of these characters that they can relate to them and maybe even see a little bit of themselves in these characters. So super excited that we finally get to share them, you know, with the world. And I'll just add that we we truly believe that our guests are going to fall in love with the uh, the characters. And this is going to be an opportunity to create new memories and new traditions um, for our guests. And so we're really excited. And we'll just quick for there's a lot of us guests who are very, very excited. You know, especially I have two kids who aren't young anymore, but you know, they grew up with this film. It's the songs we sang in the car. I'm gonna cry. It's the songs we sang in the car as I picked them up from grammar school. And even at, you know, they're 19 and 20, sometimes it's a somewhat cynical age for kids. They're I so excited. Know you get it, right? Yeah. But my daughter and my son are so incredibly excited for this because it's not just bringing back memories of this, but they're wondering to see how the story continues. Again, story is, is the foundation of everything, but um, there's also opportunity to integrate and utilize some of the technological innovations that have come over time. Um, this morning, look, it's it's amazing to be here. It was incredible to be, uh, you know, I have friends on the other side who show, <laughs> don't, don't, don't Gave us a little peek literally behind the curtain at some of the technology that's coming in in terms of the advancements of audio animatronics. Um, talk about the, the technological innovations that are being brought into not just the America, the, the audio animatronic figures, but using technology in the queue. And it's a multi-sensory experience in terms of the visuals, the sounds, and what I imagine is going to be the smells as well. <laughs> yes, you, you have that right. Well, the thing is, um, we at Imagineering, like I said, we like to advance our our methodologies and the ways that we create our guest experiences. And technology is simply a tool for us because you said it, you know, it starts with the story. The story is very important. And as we get new technological tools and we think of new ways of integrating those tools, it opens up the opportunity for us to give the guests something that they've never experienced before. And that's something as Imagineers we're always going after. We want our guests to be really delighted with, um, with the fresh ways that we tell our stories. And so this particular project, Tiana's Bayou Adventure, has been this wonderful opportunity, as you mentioned, with our audio animatronics figures. We have continued to advance them, and we're really excited about the fact that what our guests are going to experience are some of our most advanced work in that in that area of creating these characters as figures, and we're excited about that. But in addition to that, we're always looking for um, the right tool uh, to to tell our story. And so we've got sprinkled throughout the attraction um, some really special effects in the way that we are integrating that very dimensional space um, in fresh new ways that I think are going to surprise our guests. And we're just really excited to uh, have them experience it. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think, too, you're, you're seeing the folks are going to get to experience again you know, some of the very best as far as like this technology that's been developed here at Walt Disney Imagineering, not just to bring characters to life, but just to bring magic to life. There are some magical experiences on this ride and transformational experiences that, that, that happen just that, you know, have never been experienced in this particular ride before. So it's the combination of all those things that's magic. But at the end of the day, I, I say this again, it's all in service of the, of the moment and the story. And what we want is for the for the technology to be invisible. As proud as we are about the technology, because it takes a, it takes a lot of smart people, smarter people than me, to, to to make these amazing things happen, right? But in the moment, we want them to we want that technology to to be invisible to you. So really, it's in service of how alive can Tiana feel to us, how alive can Lewis feel to us, how alive can how believable 
are these fireflies, you know, that are in the canopies that are just, you know, bringing us down the bayou. And that's, that's, that's what we want, right? But yes, there's a lot of like high end technology to make that happen. But, you know, what we, we, but again, it's all in service to kind of like immerse people in, in, in a feeling, you know, in, in an adventure, in a story. And it goes back to what Walt wanted for Disneyland, right? The ability for guests to step out of this 2D environment that they see on screen and live in within the stories of these characters. And again, without giving away too much, I was in awe at what I saw today in terms of the advancement of the technology and being get, able to get close to Tiana. And Mama Odie, it looks like she was just brought <laughs> forth from the screen. And it's, it's, uh, I love Lewis the alligator, not just because it's my namesake, but I just love the character and I love his energy. But he's got that, there's that little sort of bounce, right, that he had in the film that translate through. But one of the things that I noticed, um, as I saw different iterations of the Tiana character was not just the fluidity of motion, right? And you can see, you could almost tell that underneath her clothes, there's, there's not metal, but there's muscle, right? And the, in the way she moves. But her hair, like I was very aware of the the lifelike and and realism that her hair had. Can you talk to that and sort of making sure? And again, it goes back to sort of the the the, the cultural authenticity of these characters, which we've seen only in two dimensions and now in three. Well, I can tell you first off that our figure finishing group that's responsible for putting that together is just as committed to advancing the craft as every other aspect of Imagineering. So we were really excited about that. But also we had the opportunity to engage some partners from Walt Disney World to work with us in creating the look, the initial conceptual look for Tiana's hair. Um, her makeup and all of that. And I think it just lends itself to people who have lived experiences, um, getting involved, um, have really helped to once again bring that authenticity of the time period, you know, the styles, um, and, and all of that. And that's something that we have engaged in as Imagineering, as Imagineers, as part of our pursuit of doing something that is very realistic, um, even within this fantastical world that we'll be taking our guests through. Yeah, and you know, even speaking, going going back to hair specifically, you know what I mean. You know, if it, it's hard to unlearn what you've learned, and as much research as this, as this team has done, once you start to get into those level of details, texture of hair, how it was worn, all those kinds of things, you can't ignore it. It's easy to sort of fall back on what we know, right? Either what we've done in the past because it's it's the default. But as, as I think you were saying, Sharita, it's kind of like we want to keep pushing the envelope, and it's not again in service to. You know, to be didactic in any way, but it's kind of like, well, now that you have this knowledge, why wouldn't you, you know, put it, to, put it to use? And, and, and again, it just brings some of that believability. It brings some of that, that authenticity. Um, and, and I, I think in a way it also services, you know, fans who can relate to that, you know, who can appreciate that. It's like, ah, oh, yeah, I, I, you know, I, you know, I, I see that hair. That's something, it's something I, that feels familiar to me. And it, 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 it's a connection. All we want is to just create connections for people. Yeah, the uh, the idea of seeing a character and saying that looks like me, and again, the sort of evolution. You know, I keep going back to the hair because uh, you know, you might be listening and think, "Why is he focused on the hair?" When you see it, you'll understand it's not sort of that molded hair that we've seen on animatronic figures in the past. It looks real, and the closer you get to the characters, you would think that they get they look less realistic, and they're put in just the opposite. Even the the costuming, right? I was very aware of of. The costume, again, Mama Odie looks like she stepped off the screen, but Tiana has this new, vibrant, bright sort of 1920s uh, style clothing. Can you talk a little bit about sort of the inspiration in terms of the design and what you wanted to convey in, in costuming as well? Sure. Um, we were able to partner with a woman, um, Ida Mildrow, mm -hmm. uh, as a costume, conceptual concept, um, costume designer. Uh, she works for the parks and has been responsible in the past for maintaining our audio animatronics figures um, in the park. And once again, it was this beautiful opportunity. And she has this amazing story of how she, you know, when she was introduced to her first African-American doll and how that inspired her at a very young age to go into costuming, right? 
And so, you know, you have expressed that you have been impressed with the amount of research that the team has done in New Orleans. Well, I can tell you, Ida took that same amount of rigor in terms of um, research and looking back at, you know, what the style was like at that time. But in addition to her research online and through publications, her mother, who actually lived in that time period and was a young woman at that time, uh, was a great, served as a great source of inspiration for Tiana's outfits throughout the attraction. And so once again, we had this opportunity just to take the authenticity to the next level, right? Um, and so as she was designing, she was doing a tribute not only to that time period and not only to Tiana, but to her family and her mother, right? And I think that is just something that takes takes the whole design to another level. And I think our guests are going to perceive it, that there was a lot of love that went into designing the way that Tiana looks. Yeah. And yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. And one of the things that, that uh, Ida educated us on, because we knew we want to service the story. I keep saying that, but you know, if you're going in, if you're going into a, an adventure into the bayou, right, you're not going to be wearing a princess dress. In there. You could, but it's not very practical, right? And it's not going to stay you're looking for a while. So we asked Ida to kind of guide us, what would a woman of that time wear if she was going on an adventure? And during that time, there weren't a lot of pants tailored for women. So in, in, in she doing her research, Ida bringing us, uh, you know, all this great research, we discovered that these pants that Tiana wear, they're called jodhpurs. They're, they're equestrian-based pants. That was sort of the go-to because that was one of the, the few pants, if you will, trousers that women wore, but for a specific activity. But if you look at back at that historical time, a lot of women like going on either whatever adventure safari or even uh, there was a, an African-American aviator she showed us a picture of, they're all wearing these pants. And so that was, again, a sort of a direct line of like, okay, of course, if, if Tiana was of that time, that's what she would choose to wear into the body, would wear those, those boots with those gaiters, you know, and that type of jacket, that type of hat to keep the sun out of her eyes. So um, we are again super privileged, you know, to have smart folks like like Ida, who's already part of Disney, to kind of like come on this journey with us and educate us, really, you know, and help us, you know, solve for the story. You know, as I've been able to watch the evolution of Splash Mountain uh, it becoming Tiana's Bayou Adventure, just sort of looking. I'm not very tall, but I look over the walls as much as I can, and we see this. Sort of, I started to think, you know, one of the things I loved about Splash Mountain and some of the attractions in, in the parks is they're different experiences from day to night. And I have to imagine with Tiana's Bayou Adventure, there was an opportunity for you as well to enhance the attraction for different experiences. Talk about thinking about the attraction going from day to night and maybe with things that we should be looking for as well. Okay, well, don't want to give away too much, but you're absolutely right. <laughs> when you think about the bayou, the bayou has a certain magic in the daytime for those who've had the opportunity to experience it. And then at nighttime, it's just a whole nother thing. And so we wanted to make sure that we were capturing that aspect of uh, the bayou um, as well. So we do have an opportunity to have a completely different look. I know uh, we put out a video conceptually of what we're going for for our guests. And I think it's just... Once again, a unique opportunity to just give more variety to our guests um, as they experience the attraction over and over and over again. And um, with that, I think the way that we have approached the overall attraction, whether it is a daytime experience or a nighttime experience, there is so much for our guests to discover that um, every time they go on it, they will probably discover something and see something that they didn't see before. And so we're really excited about that aspect of the experience as well. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think, again, going back to the source material, Princess and the Frog, there, there are so many moments in, in that film, so many of my favorite scenes from that film that take place either in the day or the night. And we wanted to try and, and try and capture some of that, 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 I'll, okay, I'll, I'll use this word loosely, but that, that sort of the, those, the romance of those scenes. And I don't mean like romance between Naveen and, and, and Tiana, but I mean just, you know, the sunlight hitting the water across that log that they were hiding in to hide from the, the, the crocodiles or the hunters, rather. Uh, you know, there's this magical like light that the, the animators were able to achieve with that. But then in the evening, there's that scene where I, I, I think it's, um, um, our, um, Ray, the firefly singing his song. 
uh, and 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 the the dancing that happens in of uh, the fireflies inside those lilies floating on the water. Well, that happens at night and they glow, right? So there's so many things from the film that we wanted to, that that really kind of blew us away. It's like, oh, we got to do that. We got to do that. And so a lot of that has to do with that that time of day, you know, and how we can again create unique experiences, right? At different times of day. I have a billion more questions, but I have to be respectful of your time. You have a, you have attractions you need to finish. I, I will say, um, you know, just two things. One of the things that I, that I love about this, you know, coming full circle, sitting here in Imagineering, is how it does, right? Because this is not just about the princess and the frog. It's not just about New Orleans. I think about Walt and his love of travel and going to New Orleans and sort of you know, the, the, the genesis of what now is audio and trial, this, this really is coming full circle. Just very quickly, what, what would maybe be the one thing that you hope that guests take away after experiencing the attraction? Or if I was riding with you, what's the one thing that you would want to make sure we don't miss when we're on it? What's your, you have to have a little favorite section of it as well. Oh, my goodness. Well, first of all, I think the one takeaway that I would want our guests to have is this sense of joy and celebration. That's what we're going for. That's what we need right now is some joy and some celebration. And I think this attraction is going to deliver on that. Now, you're asking me to potentially divulge my favorite part of the attraction. And I don't know that I can do that because there's things that are really unique about every aspect of the attraction, but my mind goes to just one of the aspects that will, that makes the attraction unique. And that's the big drop. And I think the way that we are approaching it is less of a kind of scary experience and more of a just joyous, fun, celebratory aspect. So I think if we were writing together as we approached that drop, I would just tell you, be ready, get ready. Can I choose? Can I choose three things? Absolutely. Okay. So number one, I hope that each guest who experiences Tiana's by Adventure Girls on the ride connects with one character that they meet on this ride. This is like, oh, they're my favorite. That's the one I want them to be my friend, or they're most. That's the one that's most like me. Okay. So I, I, I hope that they that guests can make that connection. Secondly, I hope that guests recognize, and this is something I think that's fairly unique, is that they 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 feel seen. Because Tiana speaks directly to us, right? Lewis speaks directly to us, right? We're part of this. I hope that guests walk away feeling like, wow, Mama Odie was talking to me, you know? And then the third thing is that amazing new theme song that PJ Morton wrote. I hope that, that there are kids and the car home that are singing that over and over again. And, and if, if, if their parents are annoyed, then we did our job. <laughs> I think Richard Roberts will be very proud of you saying that. <laughs> Sarita and Ted, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, thank you for all that you do to bring these stories, bring these characters, bring these cultures to life and, and share them with us. Our pleasure. It's thank you for being here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Get ready to test your Disney knowledge with our Walt Disney World Trivia Question of the Week contest. See how well you know your Disney history, details, or if you can identify a quote or sound clip from the parks. If you get the answer right, you can enter for a chance to win a Disney prize package. And this week's trivia contest is once again brought to you by you. Seriously, I mean it, because as part of the WWO Nation, you can become an important part of every episode, every live show, and the community, and for as little as a dollar per month, not only do you help support the show, but you also unlock exclusive rewards like scavenger hunts, group calls, private community access, and monthly surprise care packages from the parks. Plus, your contribution helps our Dream Team project, which sends children with life-threatening illnesses to Walt Disney World through Make-A-Wish, and thanks to your generosity, we've raised more than $550,000 so far. And I am so grateful for your love and your support and your friendship and help. And I love being able to give back to you and say thank you each and every month. I want to thank some new and longtime members of the Nation family, including Christina Welch, Deb, Patrice Roberti, Angela Batista, and your awesome kids. Hey, guys. And Dave Brookover. To find out how you can join the nation, support the show, and our Dream Team project through Make-A-Wish, you can visit www.radio.com slash support. Now, before we get to this week's question, let's go back, review last week's, and select our winner. 
So there is a method of my madness because last week we were at Port Orleans French Quarter. And this week we're talking about New Orleans and Tiana's Bayou Adventure. And last week's trivia contest question allowed me to combine two of my loves, New Orleans and food in New Orleans, because your question was to tell me what was the name of the original, now closed, table service restaurant. Yes, it was a table service restaurant there at one time at Port Orleans French Quarter. If you entered and answered and played, thank you and, con and congratulations if you got it right and knew that the answer was, of course, Bon Famille's Cafe. This was the original full service restaurant, which closed in August of 2000 and was named after Madame Bon Famille from the Disney animated feature, The Aristocats, which was also the inspiration of the naming of Scat Cats Club. By the way, do you know what Bon Famille means? It's French for good family. Anyway, I took all the correct entries, randomly selected one. Last week, you were playing for a WWW 3D keychain, a bunch of stickers, a WWW pin, and a mystery prize. And last week's winner, randomly selected is... Kathy Marcus. So Kathy, congratulations. I'll get your prize package out to you right away. And if you played last week and didn't win, that's okay, because here's your next chance to enter in this week's Walt Disney World Trivia Challenge. So of course, we have to stick with New Orleans and Princess and the Frog and some of the critters and characters in the film and maybe coming soon to the attraction. Because what famous, at least us Disney fans, voiceover artist provided the voice of Ray the Firefly in the Princess and the Frog film. I'm gonna give you a hint. You've definitely heard him and his many incredible voices before. But what is the name of the famous voiceover artist who provides the voice of Ray the Firefly in the film? Maybe the attraction, we'll see, coming soon. Anyway, the contest runs until Sunday, April 14th at 11.59 p.m. Eastern. To enter, all you need to do is go to www.radio.com, click on this week's podcast, use the form there, and this week you're once again going to play for the keychain, the stickers, the pin, and a mystery prize. Maybe, possibly, probably, I'll share it on social, a special prize from Tiana's Bayou Adventure. More specifically... It may have come from Imagineering for Tiana's Bayou Adventure. So good luck, have fun, and laissez les bon temps brûler. And forgive me for my probable awful attempt at French pronunciation. Thank you so very much for spending and sharing your time with me this week. I know how valuable it is. I appreciate you listening and subscribing and tuning in. Quickly before you go, don't forget to join me for my live discussion about my trip to Imagineering, Tiana's Bayou Adventure, and anything you want to chat about on this week's WW Radio Live Show this and every Wednesday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern. This week, you can watch either on our Facebook page or in the clubhouse at facebook.com slash WW Radio or on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash WW Radio. And the only way to ensure you don't miss a thing, there's no algorithm here, is to subscribe to my free weekly newsletter and updates for not just news and updates and information about the show and from Disney, but you also can get exclusive information and a free copy of my 102 Things to Do in Walt Disney World at Least Once book. If you'd like to share a question, a comment about this week's podcast, or just a hello from the parks, you can call the WW Radio voicemail. Be heard on the air at 407-900-9391. That's 407-900-WDW1. And of course, be part of the community and conversation over in the clubhouse at www.radio.com slash clubhouse. And of course, as much as I love connecting with you online, I still believe that nothing beats a handshake and a hug check out our events page at www.radio.com or on facebook for our next meet of the month group cruises on the disney magic later on this year to lighthouse point the disney treasure in 2025 and join our interest list for our adventures by disney to japan and maybe a few other places that i'm working on as well and whether you join us on one of our group adventures Meet to the month, or you're planning your next Disney adventure or looking to book your next Disney cruise, let MouseFanTravel.com be your guy. They are my official and recommended travel provider for more than 17 years because it's who I use, it's who I recommend, because most importantly, it's who I trust. So whether you're dreaming of a magical vacation to Walt Disney World or any other destination, Mouse Fan Travel offers you an incredible level of personal service, expert advice, and amazing deals that make your trip completely unforgettable 
and all at no cost to you. But don't just take my word for it. You can experience the magic for yourself, get a free no obligation quote, and find out why Mouse Fan Travel is my go-to for all things Disney travel. And as always, my friend, and you are my friend, whether we have met yet or not, all I ask is that if you like the show, please help spread the word, rate and review the show over an Apple podcast or Spotify, share a link to this or your favorite episode on social, tag me at Lou Mangello so I see it and can reshare it for you. And thank you, thank you, thank you again for joining me this and every week for being part of our WDW Radio family and for the gift of allowing me to experience and share with you opportunities like I had this past week. If there's ever anything that I can do for you, please reach out and let me know. And speaking of trying to help you, if you're looking for a keynote speaker for your event or your conference or your business, or if you're a creator, entrepreneur, or solopreneur looking to take what you do to the next level, you can find out some of the ways I can help you. We can work together and come to some of my Momentum series of events, including my weekend workshop this fall in Walt Disney World. You can visit lumangelo.com and please feel free to reach out if there's anything at all I can help you with. I hope to see and chat with you on Wednesday during the live show. I hope that you have an amazing day today and even better tomorrow. Always remember to choose the good. So until next time, Thank you. I love you. See you soon. Hi, Lou. This is Catherine from Massachusetts calling. Just listen to episode 775, the 10 most influential women in Disney history. Loved the episode. You and Kendall did a fabulous job. Really enjoyed it. I had my top five picked out because I like to play along, and you all hit four of them who were uh, Lillian Disney. Harriet Burns, Mary Blair, and Alice Davis, but you didn't get my fifth, so I wanted to call in and make a plea for Flora Disney, who was Walt's mom. As many of you may know, Walt's dad, Elias, was really a very tough cookie. Um, he, he was no joke, but Flora was so loving and really fun-loving and had a really – joker sort of side and really made life a lot better for Walt and his siblings. And I feel like without her influence, his life might have really gone in a very different direction. So here's a shout out to Flora Disney, Walt's mom. Thanks a lot, Lou, for everything you do. Love the show. And we'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye. Hi, Lou. It's Tom Free calling from New York. Uh, I wanted to thank you for your recent podcast episode about the 10 most uh, influential women in Disney history. And I also wanted to be sure and mention the writer, uh, Linda Wolverton, who worked on some real watershed projects for Disney, including uh, writing the screenplay for Beauty and the Beast and co-writing the screenplay for The Lion King, um, many other things, too. And she she has said that when Disney brought her in to write Beauty and the Beast, um, in her heart, she really wanted to change the perception of, Dis- of the Disney victim heroine because uh, she didn't think that sort of contem- uh, conventional approach that, that contemporary audiences would buy it. And that was uh, certainly an astute observation on her part, especially since it was back in the – this was back in the early 90s. So I think she had a huge impact on the film's success, uh, and we all know where that led to, and, and as, of course, did many other people. But the film might not have been, you know, become this uh, Oscar-nominated milestone, uh, you know, if it hadn't been for her perspective or determination. And not only was she the first uh, woman to write a screenplay for a Disney animated feature, she also adapted her screenplay for the Broadway version of Beauty and the Beast, another milestone, because that was really the beginning of Disney on Broadway. And she co-wrote... Uh, 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 you know, as I said, another major milestone, the Lion King screenplay, adapted that for Broadway, you know, and worked on other things like Maleficent, uh, Alice, in, Alice in Wonderland, other Disney projects. And since I also write musicals, she's certainly, certainly an inspiration to me, uh, as are many other people at Disney, of course, but she really has been a very, very, very significant, significant player in Disney history. So thank you and Kendall for another really interesting, really very sharp and well, well-researched episode. I appreciate it and take care.